I want to say thank you to all the speakers and I'm going to open it up to the floor for questions. I know, I can see it. Lunch is waiting for you over there. I know this. But let's do 10 minutes of questions. Some things have come through on Slido that I want to bring up as well. But let's start. Is there anybody in the room who has a question, first of all? Anyone? Yes, please. Oh, sorry. Please wait for the mic. My fault. Well, thank you very much. Um, as a computer engineer and also I study law, so this was fascinating. And I wanted to ask Rachel, um, using this platform that your company um, wants to actually use, how will it work? Because you said that the children need to type in um, their age and also type in uh, the phone number. It may help like for very young children, but what will happen when the children will go to school and they could type maybe telephones for, of their friends? That will be a little bit problematic. So I would like to hear how it actually works. It's like if you're on the on, if you're on the invitation list to get in. If your name's on the list, you can get in. If it's not, you're not getting in. So um, my background is in forensics, triangulating data points. So the accurate data points are the parent's mobile number. The parent gets a notification. It's the child's first name, last name, and the parent's mobile number, parent's first name, last name. If there's any deviation from that, you're not getting through. So it's a, it's a, it's a way to, to check. But also, what we're trying to do is transform the internet so that parents, when they're with their young kids, um, will use their mobile device and have a Manage My Family in the native app, and then they add their children. So they get an in-app notification when their child joins in a, a new uh, platform. Um, and I think that in three to five years' time, the vision is we'll look back and we'll say, imagine we used to just let kids go anywhere. What were we thinking? Um, so we've been through rigorous testing uh, of the whole processes and the ways in which people can get workarounds. And it's robust in terms of preventing uh, those, uh, those types of things because there has to be a match with the data points. We do use algorithms uh, <laughs> for fuzzy matching because sometimes people type in their own names incorrectly yeah, yeah. and stuff, right? So, yeah. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Great, thank you. Anyone else on the, in the audience? Yes, the gentleman here, can I have a microphone? Oh, the lady at the back first. Oh, oh go ahead, please go ahead. Yeah, oh, and, and in, I'll come to you in a moment. Okay, so it's for Rachel as well. Um, how are children even exposed to certain topics such as EDs and suicide? Like, do these topics get pushed out more to children? The algorithm's detected. So if you go onto a YouTube video and there's something about uh, dieting, like, um, you know, the Kardashian family, Jen uh, Kylie Jenner has detox uh, tea. Um, and so if you look at a video that relates to detox tea, um, then it's the algorithm's like, oh, this person is interested in dieting. So then there's more content. And if, you, if the kid stays looking at it for a, a period of time, the algorithm, as you just said, is like, oh, Here's more, here's more, here's more. Um, and they want it to be more and more uh, engaging and so that you spend longer, greater periods of time. So then the, the kid, our brains are entirely malleable. So then we internalize that A, that we're fat or, and that there are ways to, to, to do this and that there are other people who would be interested to learn about, you, about your journey in terms of purging or laxatives or whatever it is. So it captures people into that whole mindset um, and then it's, it's self, it's kind of per perpetuates. It's a in, real deep example of where the digital world is the real world. Yeah. The psychology of that is the okay. same, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, another question. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for wonderful presentation, everyone. Um, my question is very short. Is Google listening to us? I'm asking this because I was trying to play guitar for my children at home. Then after some time, I, I was seeing ad on, on YouTube, which I don't usually see, how to learn guitar. I was like, are they listening to me? Is, is this happening as well? Or? And just because re I, I didn't search anything about playing guitar or about guitar on, on the Google. The most suggestions, yeah. 
So, I just okay. I just played guitar with children while they can my mom. Yeah, they can hear you. They can hear you. They, they can't your question. Can it hear me? Yeah. Yes, it can. Uh, yes. Well, so this is one of the most common questions my students ask, and I don't have a good answer other than we don't know. And this is what's frustrating: is the companies are so opaque with what data they collect, what they use. If you go and try to read about like Google search algorithm or YouTube and all these things, they'll give you a broad outline and they'll mention various data signals in broad categories, but they don't list everything they're using. So the frustrating thing is, you know, unless we have another sort of whistleblower like Francis Haugen with Facebook, we'll never know for sure. But I will just say they have so much information that, you know, if if you really, there's many psychological things that happen where it could be a coincidence, you know, maybe. The reason you were doing guitar is because there's some viral video where, ever, where someone's playing guitar. It's very hard to tell the cause and effect. A lot of what we do is already a reflection, is, is kind of driven by something that's happening elsewhere. So Google may not need to hear you. It may sort of know there's a trend before you're even aware of that. And sometimes, you know, millions of people are just doing things every, or billions of people are doing things every day. There will be coincidences that have no explanation. So it's very hard to rule out just the randomness that enough people have listening devices in their home that they'll have experiences like this. So we don't know. Is Karen, that Karen, do you want to pick up? Yeah, Karen? I do want to pick up. But there's also research to show that, that you know, um, there was a documentary in the UK that Panorama that showed that Amazon Alexa was actually listening and creates this arbitrary profile right down to your sexual preference because it's listening to you in the home. Otherwise, why would it say, hmm, here's some carrots, here's, a, here's, here's some herbs you could add to things. So, you know, if you have one of these devices, then I think because we don't know exactly what they're doing, and they also sacked two of their top AI ethicists recently, um, then there is a possibility, but they won't own up to it. And this is why they... You know, like we said, technology in and of itself is very useful. If you aim the AI what it's meant to do, to crunch lots of data very quickly that humans cannot do, then it's fine. But it's when it steps over into making decisions and influencing where you need a sense of empathy and understanding, like the cases with children, pushing them down, that's when you need human oversight. And in the moment, the debate is around where, where does that happen? Where does it step in? Where do we need to re uh, regulate but not stifle innovation? But also, where, how do we hold people accountable for this? And this is, this is where it, it's, it's all part of the milieu and there's much debate that we'll hear like today and tomorrow about where that line is. Because if there isn't transparency that we can't get any AI, fully anyway, but also if we can't get full transparency about what big tech is doing, and as I said before, that clip when you saw Zuckerberg, was he held to account? Did we find anything out? Not really. So you, back to your point, you, you, we, if we don't know exactly what they're doing with it, then we can't say definitively it, it, it can't do that, but there is a possibility that it can, and Alexa um, has been shown to listen and to create these arbitrary profiles and push you into buying, you know, you'll come up with all these objects to buy, right from dog food, right through to, you know, sex toys. Thank you, thank you, Karen. And how's your guitar playing going? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they should be pushing like so many how to play the guitar videos at you now that you should be. Get a ranking. Okay. I ask it, okay. that question. But okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very answering. much. Thank, thank you very much. much. I think we have another question, a row behind you, is it? Yes, please. Hi. Uh, Hi. My name is Kurt Farouj. I'm a third year student at the University of Malta. I have a question for Dr. Rachel O'Connell. Thank you for, for your presentation. I really loved it. I have two questions, though. Uh, I wanted to ask you regarding the, the age verification thing, because I myself, I used to do it back in the days, like when we used to, the first time that I actually joined YouTube, it asked you to determine your age. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be around the bush. I lied about my age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to be able to ac obviously access certain um, yeah. content that wasn't allowed under the age minority. So how will, that, how will that come into place? My first question. My second question will be regarding the whole dieting thing. Um, why? rather than limiting what's being out there, we should also take away the harmful videos that will come up about this 
the restrictions of dieting. And then again, because I myself, I was chubby back in the days, and I was told many times, you're chubby, you're fat, and I did that. I restricted my food intake. I was at a point where I was really on board the line that I really had to take care of myself. So why the urgence now and not before? That's my question. Why we're doing it now and wasn't implemented before? Because as, as you can see, with technology, okay, there is more harm. But before, there was also harm without the technological aspect. Okay, let me give her a chance to respond. Okay, uh, so in terms of the uh, age verification, in, in exactly the same way when you're trying to open a bank account or you want to go on a gambling site, um, if, the, if the KYC, if the know your customer processes, uh, they can't find you. So they, for 18 plus, they check against the electoral roll, you can scan your passport, your driver's license, there are a whole raft of databases that you can check against. Um, and you need to ac ac provide accurate information. Um, so the unsolvable problem online was knowing anybody under the age of uh, 18 because there, there aren't those uh, databases or certainly there wasn't permission to check against those. Um, and you're right, COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act in the US came into force in 2000 and they said that's why every single social media platform is 13 plus because they said if it's anybody under 13, you have to get parental consent and every kid, everybody in this room lied about it. I, I think I'd be... Everybody has lied about their age online, yeah? <laughs> Lots right? of heads nodding. <laughs> you, just, you just do. Um, so, what, so age verification now, it's become a huge issue because lawmakers realise there are massive negative effects on children and young people. This was costing the economy billions globally because of having to deal with things like eating disorders and the spike in, in, in the harm and the actual imp negative impact on mental well-being. So governments are driven by the responsibility that they have towards respecting human rights. And it's taken 26 years for this to... Like, the, like people like me have been banging on about this for a long time, but it takes a huge amount of time to affect change. And it requires legislation, it requires standards. And now we've got APIs, REST APIs, so it's an easy integration. So there's been a huge amount of work to get to this point. In terms of the eating disorder, um, it's great to see that you're healthy and it's, it's sorry that you had to, to go through that. Um, and, and then it's just that empathy, as Karen says. It's like making sure that we are empathic in terms of ensure, protecting children's well-being and getting companies to recognise that they have a responsibility in that regard to think about the well-being of their users. And I, I think to also add to that, why it didn't happen before is because it wasn't impacting in a lot of people's profits and they didn't have to be seen to be caring. It was, it was a different time then in industry. You know, it wasn't, the, these sort of topics weren't discussed. So they happened, they were there. Like I said before, none of this is new. It's just being automated. Okay. I think, I think there were cases, but obviously people weren't coming out with their cases. No, because there wasn't, there wasn't there the wasn't social a, media aware, to do exactly. it. There wasn't an outlet, right, yes. but there that were agree, lots yes. of cases. If you look back in medical journals, that yes, the eating disorders have been, mm. been there for many, many decades in males and females. It's just that it wasn't so prevalent. I mean, this is what social media has done. It's made everything immediate. You know, if you're a brand and you do something that people don't like, you don't deliver it on time, it's not of quality, boom, it's out there, done. Before, before we had the internet, you, you couldn't do that. You had to go back, you had to go back in store, you had to have your receipt to prove you bought it, you could complain, say it's shoddy, but you couldn't get it out to 7 billion people, like mm. I was saying, instantly. Don't buy from them. And this is the thing, when you've got, you've got a psychological problem, you, you want to understand... And you can, once you get into that, like you say, the algorithms, just go, oh, you're looking at this, okay. We'll, we'll give you more data because that's, that's what they do. They don't have an empathetic channel to go, well, okay, maybe this person needs to be referred to, to help instead of just seeing more cases of it. But it, but it has been there. It, it's not, none of this is new. It's just being automated and the access is really easy and therefore it's new to a lot of people, and when you're a child coming into it, you're, you're not aware mm. that it's good, bad, indifferent. It's almost like access itself is an actor. 
The speed yeah, and the access yeah. itself is an actor in it yeah. all. Okay, I'm going to take two more very quick questions from you. Can I say whoever, of course, whoever asked me. online, uh, uh, if they are in this room, we can have lunch together yes. and uh, uh, <laughs> tell you what this means for global policy on this information. Uh, that would be wonderful. Happy. So Athena is essentially inviting anybody from the audience to have lunch with any panel member <laughs> here, yeah. so you can continue the conversation. And of course, if anything comes out for the manifesto, you'll bring it. You'll bring it in. Let's take okay. two very quick questions and then I can hear your tummies rumbling, then it's lunch. Please make your question quick. Thank Hi. you. Um, Hi. So my question is for Rachel. Um, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but any this of you can answer me. For Rachel, then. Okay, sorry. this is the last question for Rachel. Okay, so basically, you know how if you tell a child not to do something without giving them information on why they shouldn't do it, it just makes them want to do it more, you know? <laughs> like... Do you think that education still has a long way to go with teaching children on why they shouldn't do it? Why they shouldn't go on social media and post things about the, their, their selves? For example, because you'll be eight years old and your mother will tell you not to do something and then you'll be 13 and you'll end up getting groomed online. It's horrible, you know? And I feel like there just, there should be more information on why. I absolutely, 100% agree with you. Um, we, need, we need education and we need teachers empowered and, and upskilled with the information that they need to impart these ideas to kids. And back in the day, in, back in the early 2000s, we were developing programs of education saying, don't talk to strangers or this kind of stuff. And, but the thing is, the, the change with the algorithms, those kids on TikTok, on the For You page, and those adults, they don't get a choice in terms of who's following them, right? They don't, they don't get a choice when they're live streaming. They don't have a choice in who's in the audience for them. So it's an even bigger challenge now to educate them in terms of protecting themselves, which is why it's so essential that industry needs to take a bigger step. And that's what lawmakers and policymakers are recognizing. They have to create a safer space and they have to recognize the ages of those children and act, and act accordingly. But you're really right in terms of, we still have to educate. Education, those are not mutually exclusive. They have to happen hand in hand. And there's a big responsibility also to um, uh, um, platforms to create teachable moments. So before somebody is a, if a teenager is about to post a picture that's a, a naked picture, that there's a question TikTok have implemented through the algorithm. Hey, do you really want to send that? Right, so there, it's, it's, it's a multi-stakeholder approach and, and, and education digital literacy is really, really critical. Thank you, Rachel. Great question. The last question, can I just, is it for Rachel? Because she has worked very hard in this <laughs> <Q> &A, <laughs> uh, which is interesting because it shows how much interest there is in Generation A, which is the generation behind That's our Gen Z is. Actually, incidentally, this is very interesting because I'm a teacher trainer myself. Great. Welcome. And I work on digital mediated pedagogies. And usually I try to ensure that teachers express themselves to technology, not enhance, but express themselves. But my question is different. And um, considering that there are many Gen Z here and many of you are females, I am wondering how come there is such a disparity when it comes to the computer and computing industry between males and females, especially when facts, which I wouldn't call knowledge, I would call it facts, um, is readily available to anyone who can afford or have access to a screen. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> we want to start on that I'm one. Sorry. <laughs> Do you want to have lunch on that one? Do you need some lunch? 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 I, I can talk that all day on that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> have you got a quick, quick one? Quick one. Um, Socialisation into the stereotypes. Okay, it goes back generations about how women should behave, okay? Personally, as a kind of non-conforming women stereotype, if you quick flip, flick around things, you know, you're too tall, too, too confident, shouldn't talk like that. But if I had been male, I would have been assertive, authoritative, um, ambitious, you know, um, and my height wouldn't have been a problem. But when we're socialised into these not to express and not to be enabled, I do it with my students, like I got code first girls up. To, and it was oversubscribed, but it's to, I think, as somebody asked me earlier, to act that power out as a female is very difficult. I worked in an environment where I was told, like, you know, 
several swear words they can't probably use, but how did you get that position? You recently said, how did you do so quickly in academia? Hmm, you must have slept with a few professors on the way, which wouldn't, be, which wouldn't even be mentioned if I was male. So it still happens now. And there's this, this misconception around what women can actually achieve. And so we try and lead by design, but there's more that needs to be done. And we are trying to push that bar back that way. But it is not easy to stand up. When I've had females say to me, shut up and sit down, for God's sake. You know, it, this, this is how it is. And if we accept that this is how it is, then nothing will change. So I will continue to be outspoken, a bitch, uh, too assertive, too argumentative all the awkward questions, because until somebody stands up and says, I will ask the awkward questions, I will be female and do that, where's the role models? Where's the role models? We just, we just had Liz Truss as a, as, a, as a prime minister in the UK. That did nothing for females standing up. In fact, <laughs> probably the counter opposite. Yeah. And I happen to think that partly she was put up there to fail for a reason too. You know, there are things that are not over in society, and socialization is one. What women expect to do. You know, the amount of times I've had someone say, you don't look like a professor. And I say, well, what, what does a professor look like? You know, what, what, is that, what does that even mean? And this is where it comes from. When I, when I explain to female students, you know, don't be afraid to study maths. Don't be afraid to go and speak to a computer scientist. You know, I'm not a computer scientist, but I've learned how to do it. Uh, and if I can do it, anybody can to be honest. But we don't have enough people willing to stand up because it's not a comfortable place. I can vouch for that. And I have other female friends who will probably say the same. You come up against it. Sorry, I'm just assuming. <laughs> but you, you come up against it who, who just say, you know, you shouldn't be doing that or I've got an no English Northern accent. I don't have a Queen's English accent. So that has been commented on as be well before. You know, you don't have a posh British accent. So... Uh, how come you've got degrees from Durham University, which is a good university in the UK? How did you get in there? And asked to change my accent to make it posher whilst I was teaching at Durham University. So, you know, these things are there. They are getting better, but we need more females to stand up and go, don't be afraid of maths, don't be afraid of science. And we need to look at how the education is also happening from your part as a trainer. You know, how can we debunk the myths that to explore what we can do and not what we think we can't do or we're not allowed to do. Yeah. 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 That's it.